Hi, welcome to All Things Billy. Before we get started, please hit the subscribe button right down in the corner. And you'll be notified each time a new show is posted. Now, on to All Things Billy. Welcome to All Things Billy. I'm your host, Michael Anthony Judicici. Thank you for joining me today, whenever your day may be. And uh, today we've got an interesting episode that's full of opinion, mine, because <laughs> I'm the only one talking, um, uh, about the top five most important events in the life of one William H. Bonney. Your list may differ, or it may be the same, or you may think I am, uh, I've lost my mind which is fine because it's very likely true. But first, let's go to the mailbag because you can email the show at billythekidridesagain at gmail.com or find us on Twitter at BTK Rides, R-I-D-E-S. And uh, I got an email from uh, Daniel and uh, I'm going to read it to you. Thank you, Daniel. Kind of a long email here, so please bear with me. Just a little story on this topic. While getting a Billy the Kid tattoo, the owner of the studio came over and started talking to me about the kid. He said, hold on, I want you to talk to my dad. I want you to hear a story he's told me since I was a kid. Let me move this window over. So he called up his pops and asked him to tell the story about Billy the Kid. The dad starts telling me that while he was getting deployed to Vietnam, they were at the airport can't remember if it was California or Arizona, waiting on their next flight. He said a little old Hispanic woman and her daughter sat down next to them and started making conversation. She mentioned she was from New Mexico and the topic of Billy the Kid came up. She told him, you won't believe this, but I knew Billy the Kid when I was a child. She said he was the nicest, sweetest guy, and they were all very torn and upset when he was killed. He said she went into detail about how it all happened, that yes, he was set up by his girlfriend's brother, but that the shooting didn't happen as told by uh, Garrett's story. She said, in fact, Pat and Billy were drinking that night and having a good time. The plan was to get him drunk. When Pat realized the kid was nodding off, he went and hid under his bed. When the kid lay down and fell asleep, Pat shot him in the back. The woman went on to say that within 15 minutes, the whole town was awake and mad about what happened. She swore up and down she saw the body and that it was the kid. This morning, my cousin calls and she is cracking up, asking if I really got that, to, ta that tattoo. I told her, yes, I did. She said she couldn't wait to tell her mom. And when I asked her why, she said, well, we don't tell a lot of people, but my mom is a distant relative of Pat Garrett. I was like, wow, that's cool, and asked why she never told me before. Her reply kind of rocked me a little bit. She said, everyone in the family knows he shot the kid in the back, and so it's a sore subject to us. I was like, wow, and proceeded to tell her the story I was told. She said, that's what she was told too. So that's my Billy the Kid story. Love the podcast, and please to continue to put out awesome episodes, Daniel. Well, thank you, Daniel, for that lovely email. I appreciate that. And the stories, too. So I, I, I love hearing uh, stories like this. But here's the thing. Whether Pat Garrett was telling the truth or Brushy Bill or John Miller or this older woman, we're just never, ever going to know. We're not ever going to know. I know there's somebody writing a book. I'm not even going to mention the name or what the, I mean, it's a Billy the Kid universe book that says, oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to tell you about this secret conversation that happened on the Maxwell porch that's going to tear the lid off, you know, what happened that night. That's bullshit. Nobody knows because nobody was there that's alive. And a story like this sounds like, hey, it could be true, but Bill, Billy and Pat were drinking. Like that sounds uncharacteristic of a lawman and the guy he's pursuing. And where were Poe and McKinney? And, you know, it, it's pretty clear that Poe and McKinney were there. They were seen there by other people. But then again, you go back and you say, hey, if there was some sort of setup that night, um, or if Pat let Billy go, did 200 people keep their mouths shut for the rest of their lives? Well, this woman didn't. Now, Vietnam, uh, we don't have a, a year, but, you know, 60, 
65. I mean, really got going 65 through 70, 71, maybe 72. I'm not that up on my Vietnam history. So let's say that this woman saw this guy in 1967. The kid is killed in 81 or not. So that's 19, 67 and 19 is 86 years. And she was a little girl. So she, you know, maybe five. Yeah, so she could be uh, early 90s and still remember what happened that night. But it just kind of smacks of, you know, somebody said, hey, you know, here's here's a story. <laughs> here's Here's what really happened to Billy the Kid. And then they go away smiling, never realizing that that little white lie that they told her, big white lie, it takes on a life and legend of its own. So who knows? Who knows? But it's a cool story. And uh, if you've got a Billy the Kid tattoo and you'd like to show it off, uh, <laughs> email me a picture. I'd, li I'd actually like to see a picture of your Billy the Kid tattoos. Um, you know, if it's showing uh, any uh, 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 unmentionable parts, <laughs> guy's got like a, a long barreled Colt. <laughs> Oh my God, tattooed on his junk. Anyway, or forget it. <laughs> Just send a picture to Billy the Kid Rides Again <laughs> at gmail.com. <laughs> oh my God. You would not believe how much I crack myself up because there's nobody here to do it for me. Uh, so, anyway, uh, yeah, I'd love to. So, uh, we'll uh, keep checking the mailbag and uh, bring your uh, Billy the Kid stories, tattoos, whatever it may be. And uh, we'll uh, we'll talk about them. So let's take a break. We're going to come back and talk about the five most important moments, at least as far as I say, uh, in the life of one William H. Bonney. So we shall be right back right after this. And we're back with the top five most important moments in the life of William H. Bonney as relayed by one Michael Anthony Judicissi. Hey, if you want to get your top five in, of course, you can email or Twitter or just look me up on social media. But these are my five, and I'll give you my reasons for them. And I'm going in chronological order from, from earliest in his life to latest. So no particular order other than chronologically, not no order of importance. The number one most important, you know, kind of uh, uh, identity shaping moment in the life of William H. Bonney to me is September 16th, 1874. And that's in Silver City, New Mexico. And that's the day that Billy's mother, Catherine, or Billy's aunt, Catherine, if he was brushy, uh, dies of galloping consumption, tuberculosis. Now, there were many days leading up to this that would be important because it's it's difficult to watch somebody, you know, die of what's a really, you know, just painful and horrific death uh, from consumption. But that's the day that Billy's mother dies. And so that's 74. We don't know when Billy was born. Some information from Drew Gomber says he was pretty young, 15 in uh, 1878. So in here, 11 years old, 13 years old, 14, somewhere in that range is a young boy who either never had a real father or whose father died at a very young age and now loses his mother and is essentially left in the care of a guy who didn't really seem, based on historical record, didn't really seem to want him around, or his brother Joe, or half-brother Joe, whatever it may be. That's pretty intense for an 11 or 12-year-old, especially way out on the western frontier. I, I mean, maybe if you were back in New York City, there might be some relatives around, or in Michigan, or wherever the heck, upper New York State, wherever the the family might be from, there might be somebody to take you in that actually cared, that actually cared about your mother and actually cared about you and wanted to see you live a, uh, you know, a good life. But William Antrim didn't seem like the, the guy 
that cared about that. He was a prospector. And I think the thought of being a uh, widower, a widower with two boys that weren't even his own flesh and blood certainly put a crimp on, you know, his prospecting and what he had planned for his life. And I've got to feel, I mean, at 11 or 12, yeah, I mean, you, you got to go on in life. It's not, it's not a situation where you just, you know, curl up in a ball and die, but, but a, a young man with a, a brother who's a few years younger, and all of a sudden you're kind of on your own. You've been farmed out to some neighbors, some friends from school. And that's it. Do you have any family anywhere? Do you have anybody you can write to? It doesn't seem so. There hasn't been any uh, letters discovered from young Billy to his aunt Charlemagne or, you know, his uncle Pete in, uh, you know, New York and Albany, New York. It just doesn't, we don't, we don't think that there was anybody he could contact. I don't know that anybody tried any of the, the guardians tried to contact any family on his and Joe's behalf either. And I've got to feel like it's, it's, uh, it's a lost feeling being that young and that alone in your whole life. You've kind of moved, right? You moved from somewhere back East, maybe New York, maybe Michigan. I don't know. And you moved to Wichita and then you made your way to, uh, Denver and then Santa Fe and then Silver City, you know, like how long, how long did you spend a year or two in any of these places? So the number one identity defining and shaping moment of Billy's life is in 1874 when his mother Catherine dies. I don't know that Billy actually had to dig the grave himself. Probably not. I think that's more of a legend type thing, but maybe, maybe he did. Who knows? Maybe Antrim said, well, you know, sorry, them hills, there's gold in them, there are hills and I got to go. So you got a young boy out here all on his own. Now he's living even apart from his brother and he's got to figure out how he's going to make his way in life. If you just look at this moment and you go, if Antrim had just stayed, if Antrim had said, hey, you know what, boys, I, I loved your mom. She was a jolly Irish woman full of joy. And I'm going to stay here until at least you're of age and you know, get, get yourself through school and uh, teach you guys a trade or I'm going to take you mining with me. We probably never know about Billy the Kid. He's probably a nobody in history. That would be my guess. And I think some well-meaning adults probably stepped in to try to help the Truesdales, etc. But I, it didn't take. I mean, it clearly didn't take. Because Billy was not a good boy. Now, you, I know some of you diehard fans, especially the women, are going, How dare you, you son of a bitch! He wasn't. He was a petty thief. He was a criminal. He fell in with the wrong element. Hey, I mean, he certainly, you know, was influenced by those people, but he he went along with it. You know, a good boy goes to school, does his lessons, does some work around the house, learns a trade, meets a woman, has a family. He wasn't. But it certainly was, uh, he definitely was a, a, a person or a, uh, I don't want to call him a victim of circumstance, but he was a product of circumstance. So Catherine goes in the ground and Billy goes off the rails. All right. Number two, my list of the most influential identity defying moments of the life of one William H. Bonney. And that is August 17, 1877, Camp Grant, Arizona. And that is the day that Billy shoots and kills his first man, Windy Cahill, former soldier, blacksmith at Camp Grant. Uh, Cahill and Billy had gotten into it a number of times before. Cahill's a much bigger and older guy. 
Billy's very slight. Again, if we're um, if we're to believe that Billy is much younger or substantially younger than we always thought, then he is a lad of somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 years old, 13 or 14. So um, Billy kills his first man. I've never killed a man or a woman for that matter. Uh, so I don't know how it feels. But I've got to believe that it is, I mean, it crosses a boundary, a societal boundary that you can't ever go back from. Imagine going to a party, uh, what's coming up, President's Day in the US. I don't know, you go to some party, Christmas party, cocktail party, whatever it may be. And people are dressed nice and they're talking and chatting and meeting each other and feasting on hors d'oeuvres. And somebody says, oh, you see that guy over there? And you look over there and it's a you know regular looking guy. He's got a blue sport jacket on. He's there talking to a woman and another guy. You go, oh yeah, he killed a man. He just got out of jail. Murder one. How do you feel about that? Like, th that's a person that will take a life. I don't know if they'll take your life, but they'll take a life. They've proven it, and they've come out the other end. And I know if you've never done anything, then you'll never do it the first time until you actually do. But if you've done something, whatever it may be, you certainly can do it again. You can't kill somebody again if you've never killed a first person. But if you have, you can kill again. And that's the position that Billy finds himself in after he gets in this scuffle with Wendy Cahill, pulls his gun, shoots him in the belly. And Billy quickly absconds and gets the heck out of Arizona thinking, I mean, a coroner's jury is convened and they find it unjustifiable homicide, murder, essentially. And uh, there's... Yeah, going to be a grand jury. Uh, they'll see if he'll stand trial and be sentenced and hang. And yeah, I mean, you, you, yeah, all of the things you think about. But when you pull that weapon out, you're always told you better be ready, ready to use it if you're going to take it out. Because if it's a bluff, now you've introduced a deadly weapon into the altercation that can be used against you. And Billy takes the weapon out. And he uses it. Grant doesn't die until the next day, I believe. And he says, I don't hit him, I think. I didn't hit him, I think. So I basically, I, didn't, I don't think I did anything. <laughs> How'd you wind up on top of him? That's what she said. Anyway, uh, so I think that that's the probably... Even more so than Catherine dying, that is the thing that defines young Billy Bonney in that he has committed murder. I would call that second degree murder. You would call it self-defense. The coroner's jury did not see it that way. And if you re reflect on the coroner's jury in Fort Sumner that said, killed in self-defense, justifiable homicide. That means it's the opinion of the coroner's jury that this does not go to a grand jury. There's no charges filed. You don't sit before the grand jury to, to see if there's enough evidence to charge you because it's justifiable. But in this case with Wendy Cahill, it is unjustifiable homicide. And that stains the life of Billy Bonney for the rest of his days. That's the point where you become a killer. So it's not self-defense. It could be self-defense, by the way. I'm not saying it's not. I'm saying the opinion of the coroner's jury is it's not self-defense, and therefore it is murder. That would be second-degree murder. First degree requires premeditation. In other words, you planned to do it. You went somewhere and did it. Second degree means purposeful. You did it on purpose, 
but you didn't plan it. You did it for whatever reason. You snapped. I think there's probably a good chance if Billy had turned himself in and said, hey, you, you, we've been in this saloon. This guy's been abusing me, hitting me, you know, tormenting me. And, and this time he went too far. He slapped me. And so we got into a scuffle and he was going to kill me. You know, he's 225 pounds and I'm 125. And so I had to use my equalizer. I still think Billy goes to jail or is held in jail. I still think he goes before the uh, grand jury, or I mean, a grand jury convenes. You don't sit in front of the grand jury. And I think they look at it and go, this little kid against that big guy with all these witnesses that talk about how uh, you know, how much the, the, the older man, the bigger man was, uh, you know, tormenting him. Yeah. It's probably self-defense. The problem I think with that is even if Billy believed self-defense, he was wanted on other charges, horse stealing with John Mackey. So the, he, he probably thought, well, well, even if they don't get me on this, they're going to get me on the stuff I really did do. And, you know, as a young man, at this point, who knows, 14, 15 years old. You don't know. You don't have the life experience to know what's going to happen. Five years in jail sounds like forever. Life in prison sounds like a death sentence. So I think Billy did probably the only thing he felt he could do. But it probably would have worked out a little better for him had he not run away. Now, I, didn't, I have not found where uh, anyone in Camp Grant issued a warrant for him. It didn't seem like there was any pursuit across state lines, although there certainly would be uh, deputy U.S. marshals somewhere in the area that could have pursued Billy across state lines. But it just kind of went away. We don't know if Billy ever went back there. I don't think he did. Um, and I don't know that he thought anybody was going to be waiting at the border for him to arrest him. But that was it for his time in Arizona. And he left Arizona in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of the coroner's jury as a murderer. Before we move on to the third event in the life of Billy Bonney, interesting. Uh, Jerry, gosh, I don't know if it's Prather or Prather. I'm going to go with Prather, although to me it looks like Prather, P-R-A-T-H-E-R. But Prather sounds more, I don't know, sounds like a tough guy. Prather sounds like an intellectual. I'm not sure where Jerry fits. He's kind of right in between those two things. But Jerry is a member of Billy the Kid's Historical Coalition. And he's leading an effort right now, he's got permission to do so, to go and mark and memorialize the grave of Wendy Cahill, which is on uh, private property now, much like most of these graves are, in a not very well-marked cemetery. I think there's like a big rock over where Cahill's grave is. But as part of the, part of the coalition's initiative to preserve the history of Billy the Kid, um, Cahill's grave will be marked uh, with a you know a proper tombstone and telling the little story, the first victim of uh, Billy the Kid, William H. Bonney. And that's uh, near old Camp Grant, Arizona. So you can actually help out with that. I think uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain that there are donations being accepted. I don't know if it's by the coalition or if it's an, this is an effort outside of that, but line. So what I would do if I were you is I would go to Billy the Kids Historical and uh, send an email or look on there for some info. Uh, and if you want to be part of that effort, you know, to uh, to uh, acquire and place that stone, I don't think you can go there to place it, but maybe you can. I don't know, um, and mark that important place. Uh, then you can you can do it. And I think there'll be a little special thanks area, probably not on the stone, but on the website for those people that contribute. So you know, feel free. All right, number three, 
defining moment of Billy Bonnie's life. Now, I uh, I know people are going to say, oh, it was when Tunstall was killed. But that's not number three on my list. I've skipped right past that. So I hear the groans and choruses of, oh, you idiot. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. I like my... Uh, my impression of every person in the world. Eh. But here's the my logic for not picking Tunstall, is that it's pretty clear Billy and Tunstall didn't know each other that well. Right? They, uh, he was not employed for very long in, uh, uh, you know, in Tunstall's employ. And Billy spent most of his time, you know, on the ranch or back in, like, they, they didn't have a lot of interaction. So the, uh, the, the thought that these guys were intimates and friends, you know, it's just not like Young Guns. Now, I can understand that Billy um, would have said, hey, I got a job here. I got some decent guys I'm working with. I think maybe I'm out of Arizona. Nobody's going to come to get me. I've left the Jesse Evans gang. You know, this, this could be good. And, and Tunstall being killed would certainly put kind of a crimp in the plans. But I don't think that was the defining moment of his life. I think he was just a, you know, kind of a, a bystander. He saw Tunstall being killed, or saw when Tunstall was killed. He was in the area. And maybe he went and swore allegiance. By God and country, I shall avenge you. Avenge me. Avenge me, boys. Anybody know what movie that's from? Red Dawn. The original Red Dawn, filmed in Las Vegas, New Mexico. In any event, um, maybe he did that, or maybe that was heavily dramatized by the Coes or whoever. But I don't think that that, it certainly shaped him, but I don't think it was top five. My number three is, drum roll please, July 19, 1878, the final day of the five-day Battle of Lincoln. And why I chose that amongst all oh, you could you could choose a number of other things, the killing of Morton and Baker and McCloskey, you could choose Blazer's Mills. But it seems from what we hear in this burning McSween house that Billy takes a real step toward becoming a leader of men. Now he led some men right into the grave, you know. Folliard, Bowdry, I get all that. But this is the time where he goes from follower to leader. Billy's credited with, you know, at least taking part in coming up with the plan of how they're going to escape. McSween is, uh, you know, unconsolable. You know, he, he's facing his own mortality. Uh, he doesn't think he's going to get out. Like, this is the time where Billy Bonnie says, hey, you know what? Enough of these schmucks. We're going to die in here. We're going to be like the buffet at Sizzler unless we have a plan and get the hell out of here and we get out without being killed outside. And so he's credited at least with being one of the, you know, the leaders along with Doc Skurlock at that point that comes up with a plan and gets away and escapes. And that's a big leap to make for a, a guy who's maybe 15 years old, 16 that's, you know, you, you reflect back to 1874 when his mother dies, 1878, just four years later, he goes from a kid who's, you know, kind of abandoned by his stepfather, his mother's dead, he's got a brother or a half brother living in a different house, and now he's leading a group of well-armed men, he's leading an army out of a, you know, a, a precarious situation so that they can live to fight again another day. And if, if, you, if you think about Billy's life as a staircase, that's a, a pretty significant step or two up from where he was. And it really does push him toward the front of the ranks of the regulators. And when Doc Skurlock and Charlie Bowdry say, hey, we're, we're pulling out and we're going to Fort Sumner, and Skurlock continues on to Texas at some point thereafter, it's left to Billy to be the leader. 
there's not much left to lead by that point. But he was the one that had risen to that position of respect and power amongst what was left of the regulators. And that position of respect and power followed him the rest of his days. I was never the leader of any gang. I was always for Billy. Uh, that's bullshit, Billy. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty clear that you were the leader of a gang. Rudaba and Billy Wilson and Bowdry. The Folliard. Or Folliard. We've got to come up with a name, a different name. <laughs> because I, I hate going back and forth. And I don't know whether it was Folliard or O. Folliard. So I'm going to figure it out. But not today. But in any event, that's that's the time where this, I mean, he was the leader of a gang. Of course he was. He was the most wanted man in New Mexico, you know, just a couple of years after that. You don't go, the most wanted man in New Mexico is not the sixth guy on the bench of the gang. You know, he's not like the, the, the replacement gang. He's not the most wanted. The leader of the gang is the most wanted. You get it? You understand? That's like saying, oh, you know, I, I don't want Michael Jordan. I want, uh, uh, you know, Ron somebody or other. Like I want the sixth or seventh guy in the bench of this basketball team. No, you don't. You want the leader. The leader is the one that influences the followers. And in this burning McSween house, which, by the way, I mean, burning an adobe house has got to be a huge pain in the ass. I mean, adobe is mud and, you know, some straw and stuff. I'm sure there's wood in there, but getting an adobe, getting dirt to burn, that takes a real commitment. I mean, whoever did that, you know, I, I don't know, kudos or something like burning an adobe house, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty talented. But in any event, Billy, many of the regulators, not McSween, make their way out of the house. They live to fight again another day. And the five-day battle, at least the last day of it, is a defining moment in the life of one William H. Bonney. We're up, we're up, all rup. What the hell is that? All right. <laughs> we're up to number four. Life-defining moments. Most important moments in the life of Billy Bonney. Hey, before I go on, one of the most important moments of his life was when he went, met Martin Teebs. Martin Teebs is the uh, modern day nobody who befriends Billy the Kid in my Back to Billy series of books. The, I'm recording this on February 15th. The 18th, just three more, four more days from now, is when the release of the final book in the series, Four Empty Graves, comes out. I want you to go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or Apple Books and buy it right now. I want all of you to do that, okay? I'm coming to you. I'm filling your ears up. I'm shoving it all in there. That's what she said. Um, so you can go buy a book because you'll enjoy it. Now you can buy an ebook format for Kindle or uh, Nook or I don't know, whatever, and whatever you, Apple book reader, or you can order the uh, paperback. So it's four empty graves. The author might be me or it might be Martin Teebs, but it says Martin Teebs on the uh, on the cover. And we'll have to figure that out. You may have to go back a few books. But I wrote this book specifically to end the six book series, but also I wrote it in a way where you can still know where you are if you haven't read all the other books first. I hope you'll read it and go, hey, I want to read all those other ones. But this one is The Capper. And it ends on February 18th. 1878. So if you thought the death of Tunstall was one of the defining moments in Billy's career, well, you'll be happy we've at least acknowledged that in Four Empty Graves from Powershot Publishing by Martin Teebs. Go ahead and buy it. Thank you. Now let's move on to number four. Number four life or career defining moment in the life of one William H. Bonney is December 23rd, 1880. And December 23rd is the day that Billy 
is captured at Stinking Springs. Now, it's also the day that Charlie Bowdry was killed. And by all accounts, Billy and Charlie were pretty good buddies, although it does certainly seem like Charlie kind of started thinking the better of it. Not that he didn't like Billy, but that he realized Billy was driving the freight train to the cemetery and Tom had already go, gone along and Charlie and Rudabaugh and all the other guys probably would as well if they kept fighting. And uh, this, uh, we, we've covered the, you know, the events of uh, Stinking Springs in detail. And sadly, there's nothing left of Stinking Springs. If you remember, Josh Slatton told us, you know, there's, you can, you barely can even find the foundation anymore. That's just kind of heartbreaking, but nevertheless. But why is this one of the career defining times? Um, well, it's because of two things. First of all, this is the capture of Billy the Kid. This is the most wanted guy in the territory. And Pat Garrett gets him. And all of a sudden, this boogeyman that's been out there, you know, riding the range and nobody can seem to, to capture, he's caught and he's taken alive of all things. One of his buddies is killed in the process. But not only does Billy give up, so does Rudabaugh, who's a pretty wanted guy himself. Billy Wilson, eh, maybe not so much. But it's huge news that the kid is taken alive and he's being brought first to Las Vegas and then Santa Fe. It's kind of like a, uh, it's like the Lincoln train, you know, when Lincoln died and they embalmed him like 18 times. I mean, they just drove him around the country on a train so you could see his body. By the way, I told my wife, when I'm dead, dude, they're just cremate me. There's no wake. Nobody's looking at my dead body afterward. What the hell is that? Go look at some pictures on Facebook. I did, I am not down with that. I give zero permission for that. Okay. Put me inside one of those little pods that they put a tree seed in, stick me in the ground and be done with it. But anyway, <laughs> there, there's a tangent for you. But anyway, uh, Billy gives up. And the reason I think this is so defining, because I think, I don't know, this is just my opinion. I think Billy could have taken his chances and fought his way out. Not, you know, tried to ride his horse out of the rock house because he said, you know, I couldn't do that. My horse would have reared back when it had to jump over the horse. I think it was Charlie's horse that was killed. So there's no way I could have gotten out of there. But I think that they could have shot their way out if they had enough ammunition, if they were willing to take, it's like, uh, it's like the end of young guns when they're all shooting and firing and jumping and rolling down stairs and chests and that kind of thing. Like, I, I think they, somebody could have got away and Billy's luck up till that point had had him be the guy that got away. And so I, uh, I, I think in retrospect, if you gave him that chance 10 more times, nine times he says, screw it, I'm not giving up. Because his odds were not good. He was indicted for the murder of Brady, indicted for the murder of Buckshot Roberts. Um, he had a, a whole laundry list of other crimes. I mean, at this point, they were going to take him down, and that was that. And I think Billy probably would have, you know, if he'd had the chance to think more about it or, you know, didn't maybe it didn't have any influence for anyone else in the rock house. I think he would have said, hey, it's better to go out and die, you know, like a hero trying to get out of here than just to give up and be swinging on a piece of hemp. But he didn't. He buried a gun and maybe some cash in the corner of that rock house. Depending on who you believe, they pissed all over their guns that they had to leave behind so that whenever the posse grabbed them, they'd be touching their urine, which is sterile, so it's probably okay. And it was probably frozen too. But in any event, um, but, but Billy gave up. Billy the Kid surrendered. Gave up. When did that ever happen? Well, it kind of happened in the parlay between him and Jimmy Dolan and Jesse Evans. They they agreed to a kind of a ceasefire between them. 
but those that was not with honorable men. Some of you would say Pat Garrett was an honorable man. But I think that moment right there was a razor's edge, black or white decision. Do I give up and take my chances escaping or in the courts? Or do I just go for it here and now? I probably knew I'm going to die by the gun. I'm probably not going to live to be an old man with my feet up by the fireplace and a hot cocoa and, you know, whatever. And I think Billy probably, if he really wanted to live, I think he made the wrong choice. I think those guys should have come out that door firing, put off Garrett's men as best they could, led their horses out, and got out of there. And yeah, maybe you take one in the arm or the leg, but maybe you get away. Maybe you do make a run for it. Billy had friends in the area. They were not far from Fort Sumner. There were, you know, probably a number, well, there were definitely a number of sheep camps around. There were definitely places where he could have got help had he gotten away. But he didn't get away from Stinking Springs. We've reached number five, the five most important moments in the life and career of one young Will, Willie H. Bonney. I wonder if anyone ever called him Willie. Hey, Willie. Probably not. Although there's nothing wrong with that, right? Billy, Willie. Little Willie, Willie won't go home. Number five, for me, could only be the night of 14 July, 1881 in Fort Sumner, New Mexico. Now, of course, whatever you believe, it's still an important night. Because from that night sprung the legend that we all know and follow today and argue about and cuss and whatever. But the reason, not, not just Billy's killing or not, but it, to me it seems like such a miscalculation on the part of you know a pretty young man but pretty seasoned by this point, to stick around Fort Sumner. In my mind, the only time, if you're on the run, if you've killed, murdered two deputies, and you're on the run, the only reason that you stop amongst a friendly environment is to make a stand. In other words, you say, you, 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 <laughs> you build the fort, you put all the guards in it, get all the ammunition inside, and then you wait for your enemy to come and you slaughter them. Otherwise, there's no reason to stay in New Mexico. It could have been a girl or girls. I, I would guess it's girls. You know, I'm, I'm just going by having been a young man once myself. And saying, you know, if 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 Billy's this popular, um, pretty well liked person, and women seem to flock to him, he probably had more than one girl. I, I you know, it probably was a pretty good deal in Fort Sumner. But look, this is your life. You've got to know. Garrett killed Folliard. He killed Bowdry. He arrested you. He took you to court and you were sentenced to hang and he would have hung you. He's, he's probably not just going to go away. Like, it, it's not a situation where you go, oh, well, you know, Garrett got enough of me. You know, he, he got what he wanted, so he's probably let me go. There's no way you could ever, no reasonable, rational person could ever come up with that, that defense. It was a horrible miscalculation. And it's not like Billy stayed there for a night or two. He was there for months in and around Fort Sumner. He shoots his way out of Lincoln in April. Garrett gets him in July or doesn't or gets Billy Barlow or he shoots a saddle or he shoots a box of rocks or whatever he shot. So, you know, this is obviously a legend defining moment, but it also is a defining moment in the career of Billy the Kid because he's either dead or now he really is on the run. Right now he's Brushy Bill or John Miller or somebody else, and he's now he's got to hide his existence for the rest of his life. Just just a, a bad overall decision. 
again, I could see it. Hey, I'm going to Fort Sumner. I know Garrett's going to chase me. I'm going to get 10 friends. We're going to barricade ourselves in a house. And when we see him coming, we're going to take him and his deputies out. Then it's over. But that's not what happened. There wasn't any defense at all offered that night, if Garrett's story is true. You know, Billy's walking around with his junk hanging out, and he's got a gun and a butter knife, because it looks like a butter knife. And he's, you know, gets in Pete Maxwell's bedroom, and, uh, and Garrett just shoots him. And Billy's got a gun, but he doesn't shoot back. Doesn't have any allies, nobody looking out for him. Not a good way to wage war. Not even a good way to defend yourself. How could you imagine that months are going to go by and nobody's going to come looking for you? Here in New Mexico, when, I mean, this is un unfortunate, but it's, it's a reality. Um, it's, th there's a lot of crime in the state, uh, a lot of violent crime. And frequently what you see when there's a murder committed and they can't find the perpetrator, often that person is made to run from Mexico and they find him in Juarez or somewhere else. And they extradite them. Hopefully they find him. Right? In other words, that you don't you don't commit a murder. Sometimes they do. They hide out in a bunch of houses here um, and they eventually get caught. And sometimes they never get caught. But you don't you don't commit a murder and then go, all right, I'm gonna go to uh, Juarez and you know get a job in a flower shop and walk around the streets and those kind of things. No, you 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 hide. You know that the U.S. law can't come from you, and if you can avoid the Mexican law, then maybe maybe you can get away with it. But Billy doesn't do that. He kills Bell and Ollinger. He rides to Fort Sumner, walks the last twenty miles, I think. If he lost his horse that night, and uh, then he just kind of lives some sort of life. Yeah, he's, you know, camping out on the range. He goes from one sheep camp to another. He's probably got a couple of allies he can um, depend on. But in the middle of the night, on J July 14th, he comes, tra he or Billy Barlow or whoever, comes tramping through, you know, the parade ground to go cut a piece of meat at midnight. With no backup, nobody looking over his shoulder. I mean, come on. I think it was in Tascosa. I think someone will correct me. Josh probably will. When, uh, you know, Billy is with some of his regulator buddies and they're at a dance uh, and he's racing Dr. Henry Hoyt, who's a young man, and they, they're, you know, racing to the back to the dance hall and Billy trips and winds up, you know, sprawling across the floor and four of his buddies pull their pistols out and there's no guns allowed. But from wherever they had them hidden, they pull their guns out and they surround him, thinking somebody took a shot at him or, you know, or, or, or was attacking him. And they're banned from any further dances. And this kid who had four pals that were ready to, you know, kill or die for him is walking around Fort Sumner all by himself, junk on the loose, looking for a steak. Just a bad decision. Career-defining moment, life-defining moment, but not a good one. No matter what, not a good one. It just doesn't make any sense. Probably, well, definitely, the worst decision of his life, because it most likely cost him his life. And if it didn't, it cost him his future. For certain, you know, if you're Brushy Bill, you've got to live in the, in the shadows for, what, 50 years? 60 or 70, how, I don't know. And if you're John Miller, you, you kind of drift from place to place to place and never, you know, can really claim who you are or connect with your old friends because you'll be found out. So in my mind, the number five career life defining moment of Billy Bonnie was 14 July, 1881, in old Fort Sumner, New Mexico. Whatever happened, it ended Billy the Kid as we know them. So there's your five, or my five. <laughs> what are yours? I'd be interested. I know some of you are thinking Tunstall. Others of you are thinking, I don't know what the hell you're thinking. Uh, Carlisle, um, I don't, you know, who, who knows? But uh, I'd like to hear them, so uh, email me. 
BillyTheKidRides again at gmail.com. Send me your Billy the Kid tattoos. Maybe we'll create a Billy the Kid tattoo gallery. I don't know. Um, not if it's a Colt long barrel. <laughs> don't send me that. Thank you. Uh, but in any event. And uh, find the show on Twitter at BTK Rides. And of course, you can find me on social media. Hey, get your butt online and get yourself Four Empty Graves. It's a great book. It's full of history and Billy stuff and fun. And if you've ever said, oh, man, I wish I could time travel back and, and meet Billy the Kid. Well, you can. You can do it through the eyes of Martin Teebs, middling salesman and nobody from Waldwick, New Jersey, who got caught up in the most fascinating escapade of the Old West and wound up being loved by the most beautiful woman in the territory, Miss Rosita Luna. Find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple Books, anywhere you buy books for Empty Graves by Martin Teebs. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you next time. Bye.